Uh, yeah, so ba basically I had a, a case study in the title, <coughs> but I, I decided to remove it because the well, while doing the presentation, I, I, I figured out that's actually not really a case study, but rather a comparison or overview of, of main tools that you could use to, to move your data from HDFS to S3. Ne nevertheless, uh, the recent project uh, I, I was uh, uh, participating uh, uh, had this use case actually, uh, you know, uh, realized in a sense. So we used one of those tools that I will be presenting. I could be a little bit biased towards this tool, hopefully not. So, but I, I guess the, the 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 conclusion actually that you will see at the end is actually that there is no single tool that can do probably everything, and sometimes maybe you could consider doing different kinds of data uh, moving with different tools. So yeah, without further ado, let's let's start. Uh, so first, just just to understand uh, the why in the title, uh, let's let's just go briefly by by the small, let's say, introduction to to, to the landscape that we are having right now to, to, to access uh, for accessing the data. This is this is taken from this uh, kind of nice presentation for dream of dreamio product uh, so basically uh, let's say uh, beginnings of, of data warehouses you know are probably a, a very intense development of 80s 90s late 90s especially with the architectures uh, they 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 the idea was actually to collocate the data together with the compute so the closer the data to to the compute it seems to be, you know, because of the data locality and access uh, speed, it should it should be, you know, very efficient to to process your data. And in in this spirit, let's say in the spirit of this data warehouses and Hadoop, the whole Hadoop ecosystem was born. So uh, I will I will just present it in a in a in a second on the second slide, just the architecture of Hadoop, just to show you uh, how how it's organized and uh, what are the limitations let's say of this uh, of the solution but nevertheless th that was the first let's say uh, approach i mean maybe not the first but you know the main one <clears throat> so, so collocate data and compute and uh, be because of that let's say the, the the access to to the data and the, the the mechanisms to access the data were kind of you know hermetic so you had one particular ecosystem of tools, let's say the, the Hadoop ecosystem, and accessing the data outside of this ecosystem, it's possible, of course, it, 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 it you know, got uh, more and more development with time. But uh, before that, let's say at the beginning of the of the concept, the, the data access from outside was not that easy to achieve. Now it's quite easy because we have, let's say, common protocols to access the data. But yeah, that's the that's the that's the first part. So the, the second part was actually because of the lessons learned here in the Hadoop space, especially with with adding uh, you know disks and more and, and growing the cluster. Uh, it was noticed actually that because of the architecture and the, this collocation of data and compute, it's not that easy to extend your uh, your compute power uh, besides of and, and and doing this independently of the of the storage so that led to, to something called uh, let's say uh, cloud data warehouses so the, it, it was like connected because the first uh, the first move was actually let's let's try to ex, ex, externalize the data the, the, the storage let's say the storage for the for the data and let's make it you know uh, in, independent from the system so you 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 could see solutions like i don't know uh, spinning up a, a separate file system in your cor corporate data center and trying to, to use it as a, as a storage for, for data also processed in the Hadoop. But by the end of the day, you had the storage externalized. So in a, in a perspective view, you could you could think of it as a, you know, I, okay, I can maybe at some point there will be another tool that could use the storage that I, I separated and maybe I could do some different processing on the, on the data. And this, with the rise of the cloud, led to to moving those those architectures to the cloud especially you know if you if you consider s3 as a as a cheap storage that was advertised like this and it's still i guess uh, very cheap storage you could think of moving those those processing uh, tools that were that were available in the enterprises to the cloud 
and separating the storage. So the, the, the storage was separate, but still, if, if you think about how the data was organized, how, how the data was stored, it was still stored in some kind of, you know, hermetic environment. So the data was still locked, even though the storage was separated. So uh, 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 like uh, to, to, to visualize it, let's say you have, a, I don't know, some or Oracle uh, processing tool that has some kind of internal, you know, data representation and it uses S3 as a storage. So it, it reduces the cost, of course, of this solution. It gives you capability to, you know, to, to extend the storage uh, without touching them, the main product, but still your data is locked under some kind of, you know, protocol and data format uh, uh, restrictions of, of, of the product. And this, this actually leads to, to something that, I, I mean, at least, uh, you know, <laughs> Considering the author of this of this of this uh, of this presentation, but I think we we all see this happening right now, is actually something that led to to open data formats, and it led to freeing the data, so that the data can cannot uh, it doesn't have to be you know queried to a specific product. It can be queried with different products. So you 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 can imagine you you have a data on S3. Still, the storage is free, but you have a data in Parker format, Avro format, or any other format that you, you your organization is using, and you can you can you can query this data using different tools. Because let's say, for example, I don't know, Dreamio has a better support for Parker files, and it seems it has because it has this uh, arrow format support, which is kind of a nice format uh, to access the uh, to access Parker files because it doesn't need to convert between the, the data formats, uh, between the storage and the, uh, the memory. But this is, you know, this is uh, for another conversation. But nevertheless, it led to this kind of uh, this kind of solution that we have different tools accessing the same data uh, that could be stored in different storage devices. But the data itself has has been, you know, uh, in, ex in, in a sense, uh, uh, brought to, to the public <clears throat> more freely. So th this this is actually something that let's say uh, dr drives company to move the data from HDFS, which is somehow a locked lockdown uh, locking down of your data, and to move it to the to more independent storage. <clears throat> Michal, so, a quick question, if I can interrupt, yes. Anna is speaking here. Hi, uh, yes. I just joined a little bit later. Can you go back sure. with your slide previously? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a question, if I understand correctly, that like in 2015, uh, like working with data- Til, just, Till 2015. Till 2015, it was data house, ha, warehouses Hadoop. And right now it's like a new naming convention, right? How they call it? Uh, new, no? No, not even naming convention. Naming convention would be too easy. I mean, definitely there mm -hmm. is some, some kind of, you know, <laughs> convention in, in, in uh -huh. the, all those uh, things because uh, we need to have some buzzwords here yeah? uh -huh. but uh, but definitely the the, the thing that uh, that changed has changed uh -huh. is actually that as you see here i mean this on those let's say small mm -hmm. pictures mm -hmm. uh, here everything was in a in a let's say one one block so the data storage uh -huh. was in one place so you had the data let's say in org or rc format stored mm -hmm. on hdfs and uh -huh. you, you were using the tools from hadoop uh -huh. you, you you had the let's say the main tools moved to uh to to the cloud Mm -hmm. The storage was separated, so the storage mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. was kind of you could say different, but the data mm -hmm. was still locked in a, in a sense to the tool. Mm -hmm. And now the, the thing that we are seeing right now is actually that you you are having your data lakes, yes. Uh, uh -huh. on the, so this is the da data lake, uh, let's say concepts that we are using right now. Mm -hmm. yes? so, so you mm -hmm. have a centralized uh, uh, storage and data. Mm -hmm. so I, I I know this 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 distinction can be ah. a little bit misleading, but because uh -huh. of the storage data, but like separate, let's say data is separate storage, and you use yes. like you, uh, how did you call and it? you focus Quires, on data, right? Yes, and you focus on data now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the the storage in a sense is not that important, but of course it's it boils down to details, yes, because mm -hmm. every storage has some kind of you know limitations and some kind of. Uh, access patterns that you can mm -hmm. leverage but mm -hmm. nevertheless the data is let's say more important. like as a key right yes uh -huh. the key. so the schema became you know very important so how the data is structured and so on so this mm -hmm. is something that the focus is moved towards data and previously it was both data and storage yeah that's what right? this was yeah this was the uh, what was more important like also storage was more major of focus or also data or it was like like you said yeah, the, this this one in this picture. So this mm -hmm. this one actually, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the storage and the data was equally important to to the, the compute because mm -hmm. it, 
because of how you could change uh, the proportions. Or okay. Let, 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 let me go to the next slide, maybe. Maybe mm -hmm. this, this will be clearer, the, the, the first mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. because I have an additional slide. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so so yeah just just to just to wrap up this why because yeah it took 12 minutes thank yeah, you so so yeah no problem uh so just just to i mean most of you big data engineers you know how how hadoop is is you know constructed but just just to show you just uh, the, the the easy one one picture that shows it all so it was not that easy to scale data and compute independently and this is because of why so so the, this is the the classical let's say uh configuration of the of the, of the hadoop cluster so you, as you can see, you, you have something called data nodes, and you so have something called name nodes. So name nodes, let's say, contains information about the files, about the locations, and, and you know this, how to access the data. And the data node contains the data itself. And uh, if if you would like to to actually and and the compute thing that you that you run at some point, the, the mapper, the reducers, they run on this on this on those data nodes. So they are collocated to, to the data. So of course they are collocated in a, in a you know in a way that makes sense. So that the data has to be closed. But nevertheless, let's let's imagine you want to add, add let's say the, the the disk. You want to resize your HDFS space. So what you could do, of course, you could go you know vertically. Yes, you could you could just add space to to every data node that you have, and you could go vertically, which which also like, like and and this verti uh, horizontally sorry horizontally, but horizontal uh, scaling. Uh, affects everything so you need to add the whole worker node so you need to add the data and you have to add the compute i mean the compute doesn't have to be big but nevertheless it's it's, it's bounded so whenever you add the data uh, the, the, the data node the, the data itself the storage you need to also i mean you also are adding the compute which is probably not a bad thing but and also you you cannot scale let's say a data nodes independently yeah? because you have to think about the replication factors and all those stuff so this also has to be somehow, you know, the, taken into 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 consideration when when scaling the cluster. So this is a, this is just a supplementary, a supplementary let's say slide. But uh, if you consider, uh, sorry, if you consider S3 and uh, uh, HDFS, yeah, because this is this is the comparison we are making. Uh, in S3, it's it's quite easy to do. Yeah, it's it's actually the the, the scaling is you know uh, in a sense you don't have any scaling you just add the data and you just you just pay for what you what you you know store there. You have different different tiers of storage. So you, as you know, you can have like this let's say hot and cold storage. You can have a archive storage out of the box in a sense. So it's uh, it's a, it's a matter of configuring the service. And with HDFS, it's it's not that easy in a sense to achieve. So you, you probably would have to have some kind of, you know, <clears throat> separated space and, and some kind of proper organization of, of the data. And yeah, we would have to maintain it also on the storage, uh, on the hardware level, yes. Just, just to, to use something more appropriate for archive storage rather than uh, regular disks. Uh, also, S3 comes with, you know, API. So whenever you access uh, S3, it, you, you, it goes through API which is nice because you can e easily integrate with and this this leads also to to having a lot of products that are compatible with s3 api so you can have a on-prem uh, file system that could speak s3 api you can imagine those situations and those are are quite quite common uh, in example if you for the kubernetes cluster some companies tend to 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 spin up a mini IO instance and, and use it as a persistent volume for Kubernetes, for example, or something like this. So th there are different solutions, but yeah, the, the, the point is that it's easy to in integrate with. And uh, it leads to this, let's say, they, uh, centralized data architecture. So this is the same thing that we've seen here. So the data is in the, in the, in the center and we access the data and the storage in a sense, because of what it gives you transparently and how it you know behaves, it's, it's somehow not that noticeable anymore. So, and also like a note, <laughs> because we, in the previous project, we, we have those questions actually, if, if S3 is strongly consistent, yes, uh, since December, 2020 is, is strongly consistent. So before you had this problems of reading after write problem, uh, so it was eventual consistent. So the, the, this led to 
different solutions in your in your processing pipelines that had to account for. So now the, the, the S3 doesn't need any any uh, S3 guards or any you know consistent views or whatever. So you can you can use S3 as it is. So yeah, let, let's say this is the why, and I guess the why. Uh, if you would compare different storage and different uh, cloud providers, I would I would probably the list would be very very similar. So I guess this is this is okay. So uh, let's 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 think about the mo moving of the data. <clears throat> so the first the first uh, the first option that we we could, we could consider is actually uh, uh, you know you have a very big amount of data and, and you you just want to move it as is. You you don't want to do anything else. You just this is just a one time operation so the first thing you could consider is actually uh, uh, is a snow snow family from uh, aws so snow family is actually uh, something uh, it's a physical device that is sent to the customer the customer copies the the files uh, into this device sends it back to uh, uh, amazon and uh, amazon copies it uh, to, uh, to s3 buckets so this is this kind of service and uh, on the picture you can see actually the uh, the, the biggest of the of the Snow family members, this is just a, just a truck to, to move a lot of data, really. So just a truck that comes to your to your company, you, you, you load the data into this you know storage, in in the truck, and this truck goes back to Amazon. Uh, yeah, backbone uh, office, and they just upload this to to S3 bucket, and the, the, this is you know. Uh, you have to what we have to con con consider is actually the network topology that you have in your company and how how efficient it is with connecting to the cloud and this is a table from from uh, official uh, web page from from amazon so i won't get into details but nevertheless you, you definitely this is something that you should consider probably you know uh, maybe even even as a, as a first solution if you have a lot of data one time copy and you you don't care about you know increments or you just want to just just move the data you have the processing already in the cloud and that's it. So th th this is thing. Th those are the things you, you can consider. The second solution, probably in this space, is uh, is a, not really a, mo a transfer technology, but but a connectivity technology, let's say, or, or product that uh, AWS has. It's it's called Direct Connect. So Direct Connect is a is a is a physical, you know, uh, uh, connect online that you can order in Amazon, and it's I think one gigabit per second or 10, uh, 10 gigabits per second. A dedicated uh, dedicated network uh, interface for you that you could use to copy the data. And uh, what what is the scenario that uh, uh, Amazon describes? Sometimes you order Direct Connect, you copy one time the data, you shut down the Direct Connect service, and and you are done. And th there is there is a consideration to make uh, from what I read that actually okay. sometimes yes. Uh, yeah. And, and, any question or yeah i guess okay so uh, there is a consideration to to be made that maybe snowball sometimes a uh, snow family uh, is cheaper than direct connect because direct connect as, as i told you you have to create it uh, copy the data shut down and if you don't have any other use cases for direct connect for example then maybe direct connect is not that cost effective anymore so maybe snowball or any snow family uh, would be would be would be cheaper so th th this is the the first let's say so uh, the first scenario but let's let's focus on the you know let's say more interesting one uh, so is there is there any tool actually the question is is there any tool that we can use to to move the data so let's say we we don't want to use the you know the snow family because snow family also takes some time yes it, 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 you have to order the service the there's a this you know transfer time and and so on so it's not uh, it's not even though the data copied service uh, fast uh, yeah the overall uh, time is not that fast anymore so uh, so i guess this is something to so to, to consider so we should be looking for a tool, let's say. Is there any tool that can support us with moving the data? And this is this is something that I, 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 I put on the list as a requirements for the tool. I mean, I, I guess not every option or every control needs to be present in the tool, but I guess those are very, very important ones if you think about it. So let's let's uh, take this one, the, the, the parallelism control. So, so definitely if you have a tool 
you, you, you want to be able to control, you know, how, how many simultaneous connections it makes to S3, uh, how fast it can move the data, and how 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 it can stay, scale actually on your on your hardware on your on your OS or whatever other uh, te technology or solution we we we're gonna use. And as we see as we see we're gonna we're gonna describe let's say three different solutions from three different solution spaces. But just just in a second. So the second thing is is something that we should also like think about is the bandwidth control. Does the tool have any, you know, throttling limitations on the bandwidth? Because if not, you can, you can, you know, you can, uh, let's say, uh, make your network interfaces, you know, really, really hard when moving the data. So, I guess having the parallelism and bandwidth control based based on the, you know, let's say, stream of process of copying the data, you should be able to control how how much data goes in the, you know, in the time uh, you need. To the to the cloud, so you should be able to control this. So the second thing is actually, is there any 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 scheduling or, or queuing actually uh, available in in the tool? So the scheduling you can think, okay, I have a batch characteristics of the HDFS data loads, and I would also like to do a batch moving of the data. So I don't I don't need uh, to 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 you know. To move it ongo in an ongoing fashion, I could also use this batch char characteristics and schedule the data movement uh, in a specific on a specific days or on a specific time. Then, when the cluster, for example, is not receiving any data, or you know, you can you can think of scenarios that scheduling could be useful because uh, at this point we are we are thinking also about not only one time moving of the data, but ongoing moving of the data. So the processing is still working in the HDFS and the Hadoop, and we want to move incrementally everything that we have in Hadoop. And the data is, the, let's say, the first thing that we want to move. But yeah, we don't want to do it all in one. We we, we want to get also the, the increments of, of, of the data that appear on HDFS. So the second thing is, uh, the, ne the next thing is actually, how do we check if the data movement was correct? And it would be nice to have at least, you know, from the perspective of the of the data itself, the integrity validation. Because we are interested in moving the data as is. Yeah. So we we have two files on HDFS. We want to have two files on S3. We don't want to do any transformations, any kind of you know, operations on 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 the data files, because this this complicates. Uh, the process from from the you know a verification perspective so we would like to have a one to one copy of what we have so the integrity validation is very very important in this case filtering options of course we would like to have you know a way to to include something exclude something and and so on so this is something this is the filtering uh, the logging monitoring yeah that's that's also like a very important stuff of course we want to be able to see the progress and to, to see what is the the problem if any with the tool how how can we actually check this uh, the metadata copy support as, as you know in hdfs there could be a lot of metadata there could be some icls there could be some user permissions or there could be some modification times and so on and sometimes it's it's actually you know a good thing to to preserve them because maybe maybe you would like to do some post processing once moving the data to to the cloud to s3 so it's better to have those metadata, I guess, and be able to select what you would like to copy over <coughs> with the data. Uh, and then the next thing is actually if the tool out of the box uh, supports incremental copy. So, you know, you just specify one directory and you copy it over, over, over again with the same command line arguments and it just copies the, you know, the delta. And this is this is very good if you if you, of course, want to do, you know, scheduled ongoing data uh, replication yeah? and operational costs should also be you know we, we are we should aim for not having much work to do with maintaining and uh, you know uh, monitoring the, the tool because uh, yeah who likes to do it yeah <clears throat> it, it should be you know in a sense uh, as transparent and, and as easy let's say to, to do it as possible maybe yeah uh, yeah, so 
that's the that's the list I made uh, for the tools. Um, I guess you know, as as a free dot says, there are more tools that we we could consider. So the first uh, first tool, of course, that I mean, I guess uh, for every data engineer working in Hadoop comes to to, to mind is this distributed copy. And there is S3 distributed copy version as well, which I will just describe the the in the in a second. There is a RC clone, which is somehow AirSync tool for for class for cloud or for multi uh, file system uh, and cloud aware uh, storages, which is quite quite popular. And there is AWS DataSync, uh, which was just recently, I mean, November 2021, uh, there was an addition to, to support HDFS sources. So before it was not supporting HDFS, so this would be out of the list, but now we can we can also use the data sync. There, is all, there are also like, a, let's say, proprietary product, OneDisco Live Data, which is, a, I would say, an umbrella product for, for different stuff, but one of the functionality is actually moving, moving the data also from HDFS to, to cloud storages. There's also Cloudera, Cloudera BDR, which is if you have a Cloudera distribution <clears throat> and you have this particular license uh, checkbox uh, available in the, on the customer side, you could probably try using this Cloudera uh, tool. And rsync, I put it as a, as a question mark because with some kind of you know uh, configuration, you could also use rsync. But I think this is just a uh, you know as a as a something to think about how, how would you use rsync to move the data from hdfs to, to s3 but i think it's not important so i would consider only uh, sorry for this but i, I won't consider one disco cloudira rsync i would just consider free those three at uh, first uh, on the list yeah so let's let's go to to, to the uh, i have to be quite fast now Sorry for this, but yeah. So the distributed copy it comes, you know, with the with uh, every uh, Hadoop distribution, there is uh, there is something called this CP on the command line, and it's used to to copy data, you know, between the clusters, between between Hadoop clusters, or even between different file systems. So there is something called a file system in in distributed copy that you can, uh, and there are implementations for different file systems. One of them are uh, targeted at uh, S3. So there the, there is. Almost everything we we ask for in the in the list. <clears throat> uh, there is the, you can control the bandwidth. You can control how many uh, parallel executions uh, are executed. There is also an incremental mode, but the incremental mode has a has a limitation in a sense <clears throat> because it doesn't check for for the checksums. It doesn't compare the checksums. So the only thing that it compares when it checks if the file is there is the file name and the file size. So that's the two, two parameters it will compare. So the checksum is not not checked. So I guess uh, I mean even in the official documentation they say that uh, for object storages which we are we are using as free, uh, there could be potential problems with this uh, incremental mode uh, sometimes. So it's this is a note on the on the official web page if if you look. So, but but there is an option to to do incremental modes <clears throat> in incremental copies. It's extensible, so you you can uh, you can imagine you can add the custom filters implementation of custom filters. You can put it on the class path and it will just pick it up. You can use uh, different impl implementation for listing the files, for example. So you you can extend actually the distributed copy to, to to I don't know to use some some specifics of your cluster environment. Can be tweaked. It's actually connected with this one. Uh, and there is, as, as I mentioned, there's S3 uh, DCP also. It's it's uh, actually distributed by uh, AWS uh, itself, and the S3 DCP contains a couple of additional things. One of them is actually that it copies da data more in a in a different way. So when it copies the data, it uses a, a multi-part uh, uh, uploads from AWS. This multi-part uploads is actually something from S3. There's a special API for this, so you can imagine you can, you have a file and you can you can trigger parallel uh, parts uploads to the cloud with different you know uh, with different threads, for example. And this is what this S3 this CP is doing. So it's actually when it has a file to copy, it it uses this multi-part upload mode, let's say from the API to to upload the file. So it's 
definitely faster. So there is a comparison even on the AWS side. It, it, it's actually, I think, even 40% could be can be even 40% faster than the standard distributed copy, but only if, if you target as free, which we which we are doing. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's let's go to the considerations. What you should consider before using this distributed copy. So, definitely, as as we as we spoke, it's it's connected to Hadoop cluster. So, in order to configure it and tweak it, you you have to have some knowledge of the Hadoop cluster. So. Because you will you would be dealing with mappers, you would be dealing with reducers, you would be dealing with mappers, compression, outputs, this kind of advanced uh, topics from the Hadoop uh, that you have to know. I mean, I don't know if know by you know by uh, really, but you have to understand them and how how this affects uh, the, the data uh, copy. And uh, if you if you think about, let's say you have a very you know complex uh, structure of, on HDFS, so you have multiple directories on HDFS and you, you would like to have a set of directories copied in a different way, different way meaning different set of mappers, different set of reducers because of of the data uh, characteristic. Let's say that there is a directory with small files and there is a directory with large files. So you would probably consider using, you know, two different executions of a distributed DCP with different parameters. And if you, if you would like to do this and you you would like to have also a con uh, an overview of the overall process. You you have to probably consider some some external orchestration to this to those executions. So external orchestration, I mean, for example, you have a bash script. Uh, let's say that the simplest uh, solution you have a bash script that triggers those let's say two copy operations, and you know waits for them to finish or depending on on, on the scenario. But you would have to have some kind of external thing that would you know at least fork those uh, uh, copy operations for you. So this is something that you should consider. So it's probably won't be out of the box. Uh, and you would have to develop some custom, you know, scripts or orchestration logic. Uh, yeah, on the this CP command. <clears throat> so the, the monitoring and alerting is not available, I wrote, but it also depends, you know, how, how do you monitor your Hadoop cluster? Because by the end of the day, the distributed copy runs on your cluster. So it runs as a map reduce job on the cluster that you run this uh, distributed copy, copy on. So you can run it on the source cluster or you could run it on the target cluster. So it depends uh, on, the, on the configuration, but it runs on the cluster. So if you have a very good you know, monitoring system already in your cluster, then probably you, you are fine. But in most of the cases, unfortunately, uh, it's not the case. So you have to also consider this this particular thing. <clears throat> and there are options for you know achieving this, but still, it's something that you would have to probably you know uh, at least have some code that uh, you know can can use those capabilities from the tool itself. So it's not it's not for free. And this uh, this uh, all set, it can lead to, to quite complex code at the end. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. So the RC clone is like like I told you, this is like a RSync for cloud storage. It's a, it's a CLI written in Go tool. It has a lot of you know uh, a lot of providers so for different cloud vendors and different file systems. It's a really really comprehensive project. It's at the beginning, it was adopted by the science community mostly because, let's say, the the science community was figuring out how to how to you know publish the the work of the the data they produce on their on their computers to to to, to wider public. So they end up probably using this rsync tool because it's quite easy to use, <clears throat> and it's one binary that you you download and you can you can just use it. It has a bandwidth control. It has it's extensible, configurable. It has incremental mode as well. Uh, but the, the, what what you should consider uh, <clears throat> the, the, it's a community driven project, so it's it's only community. There is no like let's say commercial support or something like this for for this tool. So uh, in a sense, you would be left to the community uh, with, if you have any problems. Uh, once I checked, I mean last I checked before this presentation, I, I checked the uh, commit history on the on the project. It, there are a lot of committers, but the active ones is 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 really a, a set of 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 the guys. So I, I would say fifteen to twenty people 
doing something and five people doing main stuff. And why one guy, the creator, is doing the you know the most of the work. So <clears throat> that's also something to consider. Uh, yeah, there is also a, a, a graphical interface uh, where you could actually see the the, the jobs running, the copy uh, progress, and so on. But to to be honest, the documentation for this is really uh, is really really modest, and there is even a note that the documentation should be extended, and it's there for for a long time already so something also to consider uh the thing that uh, you know make, could make your decision that that you, you 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 could use this tool is actually that aws from time to time is mentioning rc clone as well so they have blog posts about rc clone they have even some videos about using rc clone but nevertheless if if you go to let's say now official uh, migration guide from HDFS uh, to from Hadoop to 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 uh, to AWS, RC clone is not mentioned. So I'm not sure. It seems that they are changing uh, their mind. They are not that 100% confident. I would say in this in this tool. Definitely, it's it's a it's a, it's a big player in the sense of the community and uh, on the usage. And also, it's the, the same thing. Uh, so as with you know. Uh, with the distributed copy, you would need some code because it's a command line tool, simple command line tool that you execute with some parameters. If you have multiple scenarios and you have you would like to have different uh, parameters, you would have to run different uh, instances of this CLI tool. So depending on the scenario, but most probably you would like to uh, have an overview of the overall process, you would probably need something external to the tool itself to, to do it. Yeah, and there is this data sync. Uh, so nice thing about it, it's it's a managed service. You know, there is nothing to to manage in a sense in some particular scenarios. But uh, yeah, it's a managed. It's it's flat rate per gigabyte. So this is the price of the gigabyte transfer. So you don't you don't pay for anything else. You, I mean, for anything else, of course you pay for for CloudWatch if you if you use and other. Uh, services around, but you don't pay for data sync as a, as a service. You just pay for what you copied with data sync. <clears throat> it has an incremental mode. It has a, a integrity verification. It's the only tool actually that, that has this. So it, it actually checks the checksums of the file transferred. RC clone uh, and HDFS provider doesn't do this and uh, distributed copy also does not do this. At least from what I checked, maybe something has changed, but yeah, it's still not the you know game changer. <clears throat> and there is this uh, let's say integration with CloudWatch that you could also use if you already have something in AWS. You could you could think about this as well. Uh, yeah, and what what to consider when 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 uh, thinking about data sync? So uh, the thing is, if if you if you are doing uh, corporate data center copy to S3, uh, in this particular scenario, you would have to install an agent in the, in the data sync uh, terminology in your data center. And this, of course, depending on the company, can be can be a security concern. Can uh, you know um, require some. Uh, confirmation and scans, security scans from the security team at, and can take time. But this is uh, this is how, how it works in a sense. You, you could imagine a different scenario. You could have an agent hosted in AWS itself, but then the data copy would, would have to, would be affected with the network traffic. So if you, if you imagine it needs to compare the files in the source and in the target, in the agent scenario in the cloud, it would have to, you know, get the listing using the network, of course, to, to, the, to your Hadoop cluster, get it back to the agent, compare it, and then request files again. So there would be more network traffic, more lat latency, uh, and yeah. So the good practice, I mean, and, and the, I think preferred scenario and architecture for this for, for from AWS is actually that you should have on-prem agent close to the data center. Uh, yeah, and uh, things to consider. It's a black box, right? Yeah. So basically, you you get something that you know is it, it, told to be to be working as as you you know as you expect. 
so uh, for 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 some people this could be for some people i mean for data engineers that that could be you know annoying in a sense because you you don't know what is happening inside you don't know how this uh, let's say parallel copies are working there is no docu technical documentation i would say i mean the details how the agent work so you know for for business it could be a nice thing actually maybe that you you don't care you have a support from aws and you are good but from a from a developer perspective or eng engineer perspective it could be a yeah something that is not the, the best uh, also, there are some limitations. So if you have uh, multiple name nodes, which um, of course most companies uh, have, it's not supported at the moment. So if you have an active and you know standby a, a name node, you can only put one name node address. So active. So if, if there is any failback or fa failover on your cluster, you have to update the definitions in, uh, in data sync to, 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 to yeah to make this name, new name not visible. Or you could have a, some kind of you know proxy or something before that could uh, give you the, the, the active name not address. And also it doesn't uh, support the Zookeeper namespace to do this. So you have to put a specific IP address. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and there are some, some uh, let's say, because of the new addition in November to 2021, as, as, as I told you, for this data, uh, for this HDFS, there are some still some features missing in Terraform. It's quite active development, I would say. Uh, in our previous project, we, we even, uh, you know, created two pull requests, uh, I mean, two, two issues for improvements, and they were quite, easy, uh, quite fast, uh, I would say, merged. But still, the include uh, filter is not there, for example, in Terraform, and also there are some problems with uh, idempotence potence of the of the of the resources in in Terraform for some of the things. So this is something also to consider. That the Terraform is still like in development for HDFS. Uh, yeah, and also like you know, uh, I don't know, maybe it's only me, but I, I would say <laughs> for a lot of products in AWS and I guess in all the other cloud providers sometimes the error codes are you know not that clear so in data sync uh, i also faced like you know unknown error which was about actually that uh, the agent couldn't uh, access the name node for example so it could be mo much more clearer but yeah it wasn't yeah so that's what that's the problem uh yeah uh, and just 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 to you know summarize let's say what we what we just said so yeah depending on on the different factors i mean i i just placed five of them here you, you could probably have different if you if you if in your project uh, but depending on the on the different criteria you 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 should probably select a tool for yourself yeah for your project i mean we 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 did uh, uh migrate with using using data sync and I guess the, the 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 biggest advantage of data sync, of course, is is that it's 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 a, it's a managed service. It has a nice integration, you know, with the CloudWatch, with monitoring in the cloud, and it has this even the bus uh, from CloudWatch also integration, so you can react to events and so on. So it's in a sense, you know, easy to use, and it's also quite easy to use for 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 business even, yeah, because there is a UI that is. I would say not that complex to 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 click through. So you can you can you can do a quick POC or, or something like this just by using UI. So it's a nice thing. Yeah, I, I won't consider everything here because it's yeah we don't have that much time. Uh, just, um, I'm actually on the limit. But yeah, you 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 probably you know you will have different criteria, but I guess different things affect different uh, your decision. So. Uh, yeah, for for us, for example, the, there was a big, uh, big, um, let's say, uh, how the uh, impediment on the security side. So th that was a project for a bank that we did before with the data sync, and everything. You know, even AWS services had to be whitelisted, how they call it. So they had to pass, you know, some security checks. They had to pass some specific criteria that the bank had and so on. So it took actually to, to whitelist data sync service. Yeah. I don't know how, how, how long it took at the end, but let's say it took two months. <clears throat> so it, it's a really long process sometimes. So, you know, it's also something to consider. 
and it it it, it could have a lot of yeah effect on your decisions <clears throat> yeah and uh, just uh, just uh, you know small small things to 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 think about <clears throat> So uh, definitely, if you do ongoing data transfers, definitely consider Direct Connect for doing this. Be aware of small file problem. As you, as you know, HDFS has this, and uh, I guess every file system at some point has the problem with many small files. And this affects the listing of the, of the, of the files in the, in the file system. It also affects by, by the avalanche effect, affects the comparison of the files and affects copy operations because you copy a lot of small things in a separate, let's say, tasks. And you could do it, let's say, in the larger batches if you have larger files. So that's something to be to be, of course, uh, to, to consider. And there are different different things that you could do with small file problem. Uh, this comes down to this third point, I guess. Uh, because because as we said, we, we would like to have a one-to-one -one copy operation happening we should fix the problems if possible of course before moving the data yes so if if you know there is a some engineers from the uh, from 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 some kind of company that could help you or you could could do this that's a good 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 thing to do it you know before doing the the, the copy operation yeah and also very important one of course this just you know because of the hadoop cluster being you know central point probably in most of the organizations you have to plan how, how to do the movement yes because uh, if if you go with distributed copy for example as we spoke it, it runs jobs on on the cluster so it affects the cluster performance at this at the point of copy so you have to prepare for this yeah uh, and yeah there are things that you should also consider with with uh, when 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 working with s3 I, unfortunately i i I mean, I can I can just go here very quickly, but I I won't go go into details here because uh, I don't have time for this. But I, I I have some notes also in the presentation. I can I can once you see the presentation, there will be notes, so you can you can take a look. There are also links for this, but there are also problems. So problems uh, considering special characters in 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 the in the files and in the directory structure that you would copy you will copy. You have to also like you know account for this. There are naming limitations. <clears throat> so for the bucket and for the prefix length, there are, there are limitations. You, you cannot have like unlimited length. So there's also something to consider. And uh, something to consider is actually that the support for S3 file system API is not consistent, I would say, in, depending on the library. So I guess the most support you will get with AWS CLI, but let's say in the in the and different libraries you could have i don't know maybe multi-part uploads not available because of some reason and it it won't perform that uh as as you would like to <clears throat> and yeah uh that's that's the thing that we also learned in the project i mean it's quite obvious but i think it's also like uh, worth mentioning that uh, when you copy the data to, to s3 of course you, sh you should you know design the access patterns to the data on S3 in a least privileged uh, access pattern, yeah? So not like, you know, everyone can read or write or whatever, you know, you know, you know what I mean? That's, it should be, of course, uh, carefully uh, think about, thought about. <clears throat> yeah, and also like the thing to consider, like uh, when when doing all the, old, all, all the stuff, think about the maintenance. So. Of course, we are we are you know a contract company. We'll do the solution. We'll leave it to the to the customer, and then he needs to do it. He needs to maintain it, and he needs to use it. So that should also affect the decisions. So with with let's say data sync, uh, in a sense, you you get a lot of things for free because of the of the yeah uh, that's it's it's a managed service and so it's somehow supported by AWS. So most of companies have already support in AWS. So you somehow feel more uh you know um, calm about uh, that they will handle this <clears throat> and uh, th this is you know from from the i don't know if you know this uh, acronym but it's like there is <laughs> multi ways to do uh, there's 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 not only one way to do things so you 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 can think about as i as i said maybe using data sync for something maybe using data uh, this cp for something else so you you could make a 
hi hybrid or you know multi-tool <coughs> solutions maybe sometimes <coughs> yeah and uh, just just a leftover for 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 you uh, i really i really uh, encourage you to to look at this best practices guide emr best practices guide it's, it 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 touches upon very advanced uh, things from uh, hdfs s3 limitations of the file system how to tune the tools and so on it's it's really a, a good read it's quite old i haven't found a newer version but it's it, i mean there is a newer version on the available on the web page but it doesn't contain all the information that were here and this is the official migration guide so there's also a point about you know moving your data from hdfs to s3 and it encouraged to use this cp it doesn't have yet uh, i think mentioned about the data sync so i guess it will come but it doesn't have yet so and there's a data sync guide if you would like to you know check the architecture and uh, yeah how it works yeah so i guess that's that would be it uh, yeah thank you for listening sorry for being that that long uh, presentation it's it was supposed to be 40 minutes yeah Maybe someone have questions. Uh, maybe me one question. Hi, Michal. Thank you for great presentation. And ah, hello, so, hello, Vova. <laughs> yeah. So the question: If uh, if you had a chance to choose again to make the choice again, would you have chose uh, data sync again or? you would consider another service given all that like white listing and uh, other issues yeah uh, with with our project uh, i guess that di the distributed copy would be probably you know something i would i would consider the most for, for from those tools the rc clone i think it's i'm not saying it's a bad thing but the documentation and the the, the, the support you would expect from the tool is not i wouldn't go for it to be honest so uh, I, if, if it's something I would go for this CP, but this CP has this, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, to answer the question easily, <laughs> uh, that's a straightforward answer. Uh, I would go for data sync again, I would say. Okay, okay. Because the more, the more, the more you read about, you know, uh, uh, tuning uh, advanced features of, of distributed copy, it gets more, more and more complicated. Uh, it's it's a it's a really uh, let's say sophisticated I would say um, tunable tool and yeah I'm not sure you know for for i yeah I would go with data sync again I, I would say okay, okay thank you much no problem. Any other questions? But uh, if you find, you know, in a, in a situation that you you're gonna have some similar project, I, I definitely you can contact me. And also, like Vova, Vova revealed himself. Vova is also like a bit. Uh, in the, we were participating in the same project, and there are different people from the same project. So I guess if someone of you needs, uh, you know, more details about the specific project and usage of the data sync we definitely please contact me 